We have space for questions now, and I have, uh, we have our mic guy here, so it works. You know this by now, but wave your hand and you say your name and uh, where you're from and what's your question. We have one here and then Teresa. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Andrea. I have a question for Osa. Um, what are the cal calculations? How much is it going to cost to do this? And uh, who, how is it being paid for? Well, uh, no one knows, of course. <laughs> but it is, is, uh, the mine has to pay for this. So that's, the, that's where the money is going to come from. But there's a, there's a huge job being done right now trying to just kind of find the forms of doing this. Because like all the real estate thing, I mean, everything is worth nothing in Kiruna. There's nothing you can, you can't really go on any market prices or anything. So it's, it's a big job just kind of finding the, the models for calculating that. So there's no one knows yet. <laughs> ha, and Matt, has those questions been asked in the space age time? Who's going to pay for this? Oh, of course. <laughs> and that was what the main opposition was. It was, uh, why are we spending money uh, up in space when we have so many problems at home. Now, if you go talk to guys at JPL or NASA, they will argue, well, it's not like we're literally shooting money into space. That money is being spent here on Earth, um, <laughs> uh, providing jobs and such. But uh, it's still a valid point. It's all about allocation of resources. Where do we value as a society uh, putting that money? And it has a lot to do with dual use as well. Uh, things that we have gotten through um, government spending uh, in, in general that a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with. Uh, the internet itself was a government program um, and, and they got a lot of military use out of it. The ARPANET in the 1970s and the MILNET in the 1980s. Um, but when you look at sort of programs today that aren't necessarily getting dual use, um, things like total information awareness uh, or the drone program, uh, that, that aren't being translated into uh, consumer goods. They are simply just for military applications. Uh, you see a lot of resistance and why are we spending that money there? And those, that's part of the debate. That's part of what we need to discuss as a society. Mm. Thank you. We had uh, Teresa there. Yep, Teresa Belton. Um, I, I, one thing we can be sure of for the future is that major climate change is coming. And I'm interested in what both of your perspectives, how they can help us to deal with that? Well, this, this is a kind of climate change, I guess. Uh, and uh, it comes back to the question of flexibility, of course, and being able to kind of not having a too fixed plan of the future, but actually having a, a kind of a vision of where you want to go, but being able to kind of uh, adjust as you go along. That's the only thing, and not being too rigid in your planning, but actually having that freedom to to kind of swing it a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, that. do you want to add to that? Um, sure. I mean, I when I try and think about sort of lessons from the past to learn about our climate change future, there it's difficult. I think that um, when you're trying to drive action, uh, shame and humiliation is often some of the best tools we have to influence <laughs> change. Uh, take, for example, um, uh, jaywalking. Uh, it's, it's a familiar concept in the United States that didn't in exist until the 1920s. Kids used to play in the street. Um, people would cross the street wherever they liked. Uh, and despite all the laws that were being passed, um, because of this new menace known as the automobile, uh, people were getting hit. Uh, because they weren't used to the speed. Um, so what they did is, of course, they passed all kinds of laws, but they were totally ineffectual. What they did was shamed people. Uh, cops, instead of handing out a ticket, would just blow their whistle and draw as much attention as possible to one person. Uh, it, it, and it was actively, in the 1920s and 30s, taught in school that this is not a place for you anymore. This is a place for cars. Um, and I think that that sort of indoctrination, uh, for lack of a better word, in order to influence change, if, if you have um, certain things that you believe can influence the world for the better, uh, whatever the, whether it's conservation or, or whatever sort of your action plan is, uh, don't dismiss shame. Don't dismiss 
uh, sort of influencing society in such a way that that, that is a shameful action, that, that your wastefulness or whatever you're uh, doing to harm society, uh, that is something that you should be shameful for. And another thing we, is also that you kind of can't wait. That's also the thing you need to, if we want these big things or to handle these big changes, we need to start now. Because if we do it, then it will be too late. Everyone knows this, but uh, again, I mean, you need to start now to be able to do the big things. So. Mm, thank you. And Angela. Yes. You have the mic there. I am Ingela Sjölund from Plan B Consulting here in Malmö. I have been uh, in Kiruna and following this project and in uh, Marseille, the culture capital of Europe this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marseille, their development started from the Second World War when the whole town was break broken down. Mm -hmm. And I was told by my parents, don't go to Marseille, you will be rap raped and raped and all that. And you have a very burning platform in Kiruna. Mm. The town is just falling down and Marseille had too. Mm. Do you have any reflections about uh, how can we learn from Marseille, from Dublin, from Liverpool and your very burning platform? It was a south uh, social breakdown in one of the cases and mm. here is a physical breakdown. So have you learned from the past into making uh, well, this leap? I, I don't, this is maybe a bit pessimistic, but <laughs> in a way it doesn't, it's not enough that, it's <laughs> that, it kind of is, that there is a crisis. You still need to do the work. I mean, that's one of the big, big, big things about Kirina now. It's th if they don't take action and do this and really commit and do this, start now and do all these different things that they need to do, it's not going to work. It's going to disappear. So just uh, that, that they have to is not enough. It still needs to do all the work and it still kind of needs this big commitment. And I think that's kind of, kind of also to what you were talking about earlier about it's not easy and it's not, of course we can learn that uh, to kind of see how they did it because they had to, but there's still a it's, I'm not sure if they're gonna do it. I'm still kind of questioning if they're gonna make it. So I think, and then luck comes into it as well. I think like in some cases, like Malmö, I think sometimes got lucky. So uh, there are so different things that we can't really control, but uh, we have to really, if we want to make a change, we really, really need to commit. That's the kind of the thing. We really need to do it. We really dare to, d dare to dream a long dream. That's that I think is important. And you're linking into what Malik talked about yesterday, that there's no such thing as luck. It's a lot of hard work <laughs> and it can show up as luck. But no. what's stopping the commitment then? Why don't we want to envision and just do it? Well, it's the same reason why, th why, they lost, why the people of Kiruna have lost trust in the politicians. You don't dare take the decisions. You're kind of pushing it to someone else to do take the big decisions. And you don't feel empowered to do it. So it's an unclear system of who is in charge of things. And it's a, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the reason there is no one who feels like I have to do it. There's just people kind of backing away from it. And I, I would just disagree that there's no such thing as luck. I am a firm believer <laughs> in luck. Um, <laughs> I, we don't live in a meritocracy. Uh, not every great idea wins. Um, a firm believer in luck, and, and I am an example of that, that I have worked very hard. I am tremendously lucky that I get to do what I've always wanted to do, which is write for a living uh, and, and research, and I, I have my dream job. Um, but there are a lot of other people in the world that have tried just as hard and are much more competent than I who don't have my job. Uh, the, being in the right place at the right time, I, I, I can't disagree strongly <laughs> enough that there is no such thing as luck. There's definitely such thing as luck. So what do they need? What luck do they need in Kiruna? I don't know. I, you know, that not um, believing in luck or uh, believing in luck doesn't mean that I don't believe you have to work hard. Mm. I think that obviously, you know, as, as you said, there's a lot of challenges ahead that you need to work towards. Mm. Um, but sometimes things don't happen and get derailed for any number of reasons. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we wish them luck. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that, that could be a good ending, but uh, we're pushing it. We have another. We have room for one more question, and we have. That was our luck. It was our last question, so I think that was meant to be. And thank you a lot for sharing your stories you. and.